All right, welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Recovery Live. This event is brought to you by the Substance Use and Mental Health Services Administration. Bring recovery sports to scale, technical assistance strategy, otherwise, otherwise known as Brass Pack. Our TA Center is dedicated to increasing access to recovery support. We achieve this work through a variety of mecha mechanisms, including a lot of TA focused on system transformation and the developing the capacity of peer-run recovery communities and family and youth-led organizations. We are very fortunate today to have some really awesome presenters who will be talking about uh, active engagement and services for crisis outreach and really warm handoffs. Um, I'm really excited to uh, first present Mindy Harrison. She's the director of the Peer Support Specialist Network of Maine, and Brandon George, the director of the Indiana Addiction Issue Coalition, which advocates for uh, substance use disorder recovery through public policy and education. Uh, I'll be turning things over to them shortly, but I just want to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, Recovery Alive events are different than your usual webinars. First, they're much more exciting and interactive. Uh, we really want you to engage directly with us. I see a lot of you are already tapping in the type, tap, typing in the chat box. Please keep that up. We're going to have a lot of poll questions, um, and we do want you to raise questions uh, as they come up for you, but we'll also have a Q&A at the end. But feel free to kind of fire them up as they go along, and we'll do our best to either answer them as we go or answer them as we go or answer them on the back end. Um, everybody that's on the webinar currently is in listen-only mode. We'd love to be able to talk with each one of you, but that's just not possible because there's so many of you. Um, we have several resources uh, on this topic available for download in our resource box. To download a file, highlight the name of the document and hit the download button. Um, and it will be automatically sent to your computer. Uh, often our people will share links of their own favorite resources in the chat box. This event is being recorded, and the recorded links will be shared with all registrants after the event. Uh, you'll be able to review the chat and rewatch the presentation using the link. Uh, so if you really love it and want to watch it again, it will be available. Uh, today's session will last about an hour. Uh, if, as you are listening to this con content, you feel your organization may need technical assistance around this or any other topic, please copy the link from our online TA request form from the instructions box. Uh, as people are arriving today, we actually already posted one poll question. I see a bunch of us filled it out already. Um, if you hadn't got a chance to, please take a couple of seconds and fill that out. Uh, and let me just take a quick peek and see what people's roles are. So we have a lot of peers in the room, which is awesome. Nothing about us without us. That's what I always say when it comes to peers. And the second biggest group is we got a lot of supervisors here. All right. Oh, and a lot of social workers. Yay to my fellow social workers. That's what we like to see. All right. So um, as we get done with the poll, I'd like to turn it over to Brandon. Or is it Mindy that's going first? Sorry. I lost my spot. I think we are going over to Mindy, I believe. All right. Oh, you're muted, Mindy. I am. <laughs> there is a couple of quotes on this slide that are really uh, about the effective integration, prevention, treatment, and recovery services um, that peers lend uh, in the substance use community. Um, Regardless of specific roles, uh, people are finding that peer support staff can also enhance organizational culture and add a crucial element to the treatment team that really complements existing services within those structures. A peer support specialist is an individual with lived experience um, whose experience life challenges. They may have or may be receiving mental health service for services and supports of their own. Peer recovery coaches are a little more um, prone to supporting people with substance use issues and experiences. That's really what the recovery coach is geared towards, whereas peer support specialists traditionally support people that are having mental health challenges. Uh, both types of peers provide different kinds of connections in navigating recovery support systems and resources, uh, which include professional as well as non-professional or peer-led services. 
a warm handoff is a long-standing strategy in the social services medical world uh, to transfer care from one system into another or a community system and team um, outside of inpatient settings or hospital settings. So with that, um, warm, warm handoffs is what the focus is today, and there's a couple areas where that happens more so than others. Um, the one that we're going to really talk a lot about today is peers in the EDs and the emergency departments, um, what the role is, what it looks like um, in different areas. Um, we're fortunate in Indiana, we've been a recipient of uh, my organization specifically about six SAMHSA grants, and two of them have been heavily uh, built around the recovery supports and recovery community supports. And over the last handful of years, um, peers have been making their entrance into the emergency departments. And we're lucky. We've had a project going for several years at this point um, with Indiana University and uh, actually Eskenazi Hospital called Project Point. Um, that we'll talk about, and they have really been carrying a lot of the water. One of the PowerPoints that's attached for download, Dr. Brucker, uh, you can see some of their amazing work um, because they're really the, the group that's figured out with the bumps and bruises how to, to get some of this stuff done. And um, unfortunately, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach, though. And if you're on here and you're thinking about putting peers into your emergency department, um, you really need to take a makeup of what your town or your city looks like. Um, the, the group we were just talking about with Eskenazi, they have multiple um, coaches that are full-time. Um, and that's great when you're talking about a larger city where you have the need and the demand to have people around on call um, day and night, sometimes overnight for some hospitals. Whereas rural um, emergency departments might only have uh, one overdose or two overdoses a week. Um, and you're not going to need somebody there 24-7. Um, you're going to have to have them on call. Um, have contracts possibly with uh, local community mental health centers um, or other recovery community organizations um, that can help get them um, to the hospitals when in need. Um, another thing we want to talk on is how does that work when people are on call? Um, how do we get peers into um, the departments? And a lot of times that's through the clinical staff or the nursing staff. Again, it's going to depend a lot on the, the hospital setup. Uh, one of the hospitals that we have peers in, they actually have a um, whole wing uh, that is treatment that involves IOP, and they've got clinical staff on there, they've got peers on their staff, and they can just go down um, essentially to the emergency department when people come in. Um, and in other cases, it's going to take them a half hour, hour to, to show up. Um, and that coverage is going to vary dramatically um, as well. Um, Indiana has a wide variety of areas. We are, um, you know, mostly rural, but we have Indianapolis, Gary, Evansville, some larger cities. Um, and, and so one of the main benefits, I think, that, that, that we found out is we've got a couple different models. Um, some po hospitals have full three shifts going on, um, 7 to 3, 3 to 11, 11 to 7, and having somebody there all the time. Um, and then we have other ones that are on uh, two shifts a day. And then something really new that's happening is we're doing virtual peers um, with Indiana University Health. Um, they have got uh, seven rural hospitals that they're providing uh, virtual services for um, to help access um, some of, uh, you know, get people into the right services and provide peer supports where they wouldn't be able to do so normally. So, um, we talked a little bit about the, the decisions that people have to make and whether they are going to directly hire peers or whether they are going to, to contract them out. Um, some of the drawbacks um, to hiring them directly is, um, one, um, the HR departments at hospitals, um, they have a whole bunch of in-house counsel and their whole goal is to make sure they're not opened up to liability. And, not sure if everybody on here is aware of it, but a lot of people um, in our field of peers have criminal history because of the criminalization of drug use. So it's presented a major barrier over the last couple of years with getting peers hired in. One way to, I don't want to say get around it, but to eliminate that barrier is to contract out the services with a, um, an organization that already has a relationship with the hospital. 
has made that part of the process much, much smoother. And, um, but um, at the same time, you don't have them there um, all the time and they're not on call, so there is a delay in getting them over. And the other part that, that really ends up being an issue is when a peer works inside of a specific organization, they have to follow that organization's rules. And what we've seen in some areas of Indiana and around recovery community organizations and centers, if, if somebody goes into that center and they are attached to a treatment provider, that peer really isn't giving them the wide array of services. They, they, they're most likely going to get into um, that treatment provider system. Um, and to me, that's one of the main benefits of the peers is they're supposed to uh, be independent. They're supposed to be apolitical. They're supposed to get people wherever they need to go. So I think that there's a real benefit to the contracting. Um, they're not beholden to one treatment service, um, and it, it allows them to operate uh, in a little bit more area. I was hoping to answer a quick question, sorry. Um, I think that is where I want to move on at, uh, mainly just noting that, that when peers, regardless of their role, whether they're contracted or whether they're, they're hired, um, you know, they're supposed to be walking resources. Um, you know, medication um, is a big part, um, a, a hot topic right now, especially when people are coming in from ODs. And it, it's something that there has to be the resources set up. Devin's going to talk later about building relationships with people in the community. Uh, but having set up where either doctors in the emergency departments are doing carryover scripts for a couple days and having relationships with doctors to, to make sure that people are, because we lose a lot of people in between those day or twos, we all know that the window is very, very small to help people. Um, and if we do not um, get hold of them while they're in there, if we send them out and withdrawal or we send them out for a week, we usually know that we're going to lose that person. So. Um, it's a critical point, um, and I want to make sure that we make note of it. All right, real quick, I just wanted to comment on the poll and, and throw in a funny story. When the first um, emergency room in the northern suburbs of Philadelphia started their warm handoff program, they had all of their peers there uh, from 9 to 5 on Monday through Friday, and they figured out that most of the overdose incidences were happening uh, over the weekend at an evening. And, and really what that told me is they didn't have peers integrated in their development team. So that's part of the reason we're asking this poll question is, you know, how are your peers integrated in your staff? Um, so it seems like a lot of people have hired peer support specialists. Um, some people are having them in meetings. Um, and what I guess one thing we guess we need to maybe work on for a future webinar or Recovery Live is making sure that our peers are receiving uh, supervision because that's definitely a big thing. Uh, thanks everybody for filling that part out and I'm gonna hand it over to Mindy. Thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about peer support specialists within emergency departments, more specifically for mental health and crisis kinds of support. Uh, the agency that I work for, Amistad Inc., uh, based out of Portland, Maine, has been overseeing an emergency department program since 2002. We have seven peer support specialists that work within there. Um, and a, a lot of what we try to do is go in and connect with people, which is often on uh, what may very well be the worst day of their lives. Uh, you know, through conversation, sometimes it's, you know, getting them a turkey sandwich or ginger ale um, or playing a hand of, you know, a hand of cards with them. So, you know, we meet with everybody, whether, you know, they're having really extreme experiences or, you know, as, as you know, for medical terms, maybe experiencing extreme psychosis. Um, we work with people, you know, when they're experiencing crisis, sometimes it can be somebody who's lost their child or is experiencing homelessness, uh, and really seek to create uh, community connections for them or natural support. A big piece of what we see within the psychiatric emergency department is the people that uh, are, are the top utilizers of that space often really don't need that le level of support. So that is um, really where the peer support 
started from was trying to connect people to the community resources so they would utilize those in place of coming to the emergency department, which most people are aware uh, cost quite a, a lot more uh, than a couple of hours of peer support services. Um, so within the ED, we talk about community resources uh, for, for the people that are in there, which often include things like mental health treatment facilities, um, recovery resources, peer-led groups, uh, peer centers that are accessible. We can really discuss the, what they're lacking for basic needs, which includes sometimes health insurance or housing, um, and you know, point them in to a direction for a wide variety of different groups and individual supports that are available in the greater Portland area. Um, so that's a lot of what we do within that setting is really suggest alternative um, places for them to go to. Uh, Amasad has been around since 1982. Uh, we operate three recovery centers, uh, as, as well as a street outreach program. We just opened means for medically assisted treatment residents for women. Um, and we have peer support specialists within the emergency department, as well as at our state psychiatric hospital, which we've ha held that contract since 2006. Um, so all of the staff working within these settings are required to attend the intentional peer support model, which was developed by Sherry Mead back in 2006. Um, if you go to Vermont um, and do the training or someplace else, because they do travel internationally to offer those trainings, uh, it is only a five-day program. What we have done here in Maine, because we did work alongside Sherry to implement the the pilot model is we have adopted that as our recognized state certification programming, um, and people attend one full day a week for eight weeks. Um, and at the end, they take a final written exam, um, and then they're required to have co quarterly supervisory type meetings. Uh, it used to be called co-supervision. That didn't really uh, support the mutuality that IPS kind of encompasses, so it's been changed to co-reflection. Uh, and they're also required to take two, a minimum of two continuing edu education classes per year. Uh, once a year, they are expected to sit down and do what is called the fidelity review uh, to be sure that they are working within the fidelity of the intentional peer support model. And I, I think that this training is really what has made these programming so successful because not only are they practicing intentional peer support with the people that they support in the various settings and in the emergency department, uh, but our staff really go above and beyond to practice the tasks with the other staff and the other treatment team members as well, um, which has really helped us to work within these systems successfully. Um, something that I like to share about that is, is our team up at the State Psychiatric Hospital also trained in intentional peer support. Often the other hospital staff will find themselves in the peer support office uh, getting support from that team uh, that they're not getting through other places in the hospital, which is pretty, pretty unique. Um, all of our programs are a mixture of state funding, city block grant dollars, uh, and we do have several private funders as well that make uh, our street outreach program possible. Um, we do contract with outside agencies, mental health agencies, to provide peer support specialists within those settings, uh, as well as we've provided supervision for agencies who are just getting peer support specialists up and running and integrated within their teams, and they're not really sure how to supervise them. So those are some of the things that uh, we have offered historically and, and currently continue to offer. Um, we were at Maine Medical Center, which is one of Maine's largest hospitals. Uh, we worked within the emergency department there, which has a specific locked uh, psychiatric unit. We had been there from 2002 until last year, 2017. We did just recently move our contract over to Mercy Hospital, um, who seems to be a little bit more in line with our values and what we're hoping to provide to people. Um, we have, um, we're there seven nights a week from five o'clock to 11 o'clock at night, uh, but we also have people available to meet with folks um, at the hospital off hours, and we also uh, try to bridge them um, into some of our other existing programs, or if we know of other peer programs within different traditional agencies, uh, we'll meet with people and support them uh, bridging that gap. Um, so our outreach programs are funded primarily by private funders and also through the block grant dollars. 
we um, work with the city with the, to kind of reduce the amount of long-term stayers at uh, the shelters. So really trying to support them in getting housed um, in, in finding other resources in the community instead of just hanging out like at the resource center all day, um, which is one of the larger day programs for us in Portland, Maine. Um, what's kind of unique about our outreach program is that if there's somebody who's experiencing significant uh, mental health issues on the street are really having extreme experiences, um, the police have been known to call our outreach workers in place of bringing the people to jail or to the hospital, which is really kind of unique um, and something that we're pretty proud of. Um, we do visit inmates in the correction facilities as they're nearing the end of their stay there um, and support them in getting linked to sober housing. Uh, you know, a couple of our street outreach peers also operate sober housing programs, which is really neat. Uh, so we can bridge that gap and make sure that they have a place to go uh, to get set up and get back to work. Um, and, you know, really just try to reach resources that aren't always available to them when they're not able to meet with peers within those settings. Um, All right. So um, one of the things that Mindy had touched on, which we're going to, uh, I'm going to spend a, a lot of my time talking about, uh, is the supervision piece that they help provide in, in, in TED settings for people that haven't been doing it. It's a vital, vital role. And, um, you know, so I talked about having a variety of settings. We've got about five rural counties that have the peers. We've got a couple of major hospitals in Indianapolis and the virtual stuff going on. but. I think everybody really when they're getting this started has to decide um, what they're really doing. Are, are we hiring a recovery coach or a peer or a recovery specialist just so that we can check a box and say that we now have a recovery coach um, and have another service that, that we provide on the side? Or are we really trying to switch our system over and, and get it a more recovery oriented system and make it an organizational change? to offer recovery support services, um, which we know is a key component um, of the, the continuum of care for substance use disorders. Um, and simply, it, it, we've seen this go wrong before where organizations will hire a coach, um, put them in an ED by themselves or with one other person, um, and they have no support. They, they, they don't have any other people that they can bounce stuff off of. They don't have um, a way to sharpen their skills. Um, Phil Valentine from CCAR calls it coach on an island. Um, and I think that's the perfect way to put it. You've got a coach literally out there on an island. Um, a lot of times they might end up being the only person in the organization um, that knows about peers. So how are they supposed to get proper supervision if um, they're, 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 they know more than anybody else um, in the building? So I think that it's important when People are brought on, um, that teens are educated. You know, a lot of times therapists think that um, peer coaches are there to take their job, um, that they're trying to get bachelor's level and high school level people and they can pay less to do the same job. Um, and that's just couldn't be further from the truth. Um, you know, peers are a complementary piece to the treatment team. They're not taking any spots. And actually what it allows um, therapists to do, and, and, and doctors for that matter, is practice to the top of their license. Therapists can stop staying on the phone for 15, 20 minutes, making calls to recovery residences and, and other places, and they can actually uh, worry about the therapy part of it. So um, when we introduce peers, we've got to have staff meetings. We've got to tell people what their role is. We've seen it happen on both sides. We, we've had some recovery coaches that ended up taking out trash and answering phones. And then we've had other recovery, recovery coaches that were told to do biopsychosocial assessments, neither of which are within the scope of work um, for what recovery coaches should be doing. So um, we can't have other supervisors making decisions and telling people to stuff that, do stuff that's outside of their scope of work. Critical, critical, critical. Um, after um, the first several years with IU, um, one of the things we were able to look back on um, and see was the biggest gap was supervision. And with this being a newer position, I mean, coaches have been around for over a decade, but it's only really caught on over the last handful of years. So um, there's not um, 
there, there's not the infrastructure within organizations. And we really think the, the gold standard is if you're going to bring peers into your organization, you're going to have a department of them. You're not going to have that coach on the island um, or a sub-department of them that is part of the clinical team, and it will allow um, uh, people to get the proper uh, development and direction uh, that they need. So um, what that would look like is the supervisor either, um, what we would prefer is that the supervisor actually go through the recovery coach training um, or at the very, very least go through supervision training um, so that they do have that knowledge of what a peer role is supposed to do and what they're not supposed to do. And to also make sure that they are getting their continuing education. Um, peers, just like other professions, I know in Indiana we've got to have uh, 40 CEUs every two years, so there has to be ongoing continuing education, making sure um, that people um, are getting the latest information um, and who's supervising it, who's overseeing, making sure it's happening, is the company paying for it, are they investing in peers the same way that they would invest in every other profession that they have in there. Um, so to a critical part, we think that one hour of direct supervision every peer should have. You would have more than that throughout the week. Um, one thing that we're doing in Indiana that, that we certainly aren't the first of this party, but Project ECHO, um, Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes, is a great training mechanism, mechanism especially when you have rural areas. Um, what it allows um, states to do or areas to do is train people in rural areas with a, uh, a hub, essentially, it's a hub-and-spoke model where you've got um, a variety of team members, psychiatrists, addiction docs, peers, attorneys, um, all in one area so people can log on from all over the state um, and get information from experts in whatever that um, area is. So one more thing I want to touch on before I'm done, um, which outside of supervision I think is the most uh, uh, important piece, is making sure that peers have self-care and wellness. One thing we completely uh, uh, missed um, was the impact it was going to have on peers working in an acute trauma situation and uh, making sure that peers are taking care of themselves, promoting an atmosphere in which they're allowed to. Um, I know Project Point, specifically with Eskenazi, they actually pay their coaches for wellness days. Uh, I think it's once a month you can, uh, on the, the company's dime, go out and do an activity um, that's wellness related. They're allowed to go to recovery meetings on the clock. Obviously there needs to be communication with the staff and there's a board that says when they're in and out. Um, but this really is a, a, a critical piece of it because if those coaches aren't uh, taking care of themselves, there's no good to anybody else. Um, so uh, supervision, self-care, um, two things to definitely watch for during implementation. All right. Awesome. Great job, Brandon. And I just want to, you know, take a look at this poll. I, poll, poll. I think uh, what I see here is that everybody thinks that we need recovery coaches all over the place, from police departments, crisis teams, EDs, uh, institutions of higher uh, learning, outpatient programs, and I just think that that is so spot on and it really kind of helps us transition to our next slide, is that we cannot put peers in a box. You know, peer, this is your lane, this is where you belong, this is the only place you could be, because far too often uh, the fact that people with substance use disorder are criminalized and relegated over there, uh, you know, we have to be advocates for our clients that are, um, you know, experiencing some kind of crisis. And we have to get out of our lane and go into other lanes because we have to build relationships. You know, when somebody comes in and is experiencing a mental health or substance use disorder crisis, we have to know all the resources in the community, right? We have to be the social worker. We have to be the case manager. We have to know who the good therapists are in town. Uh, what are the good treatment centers? We want to know, you know, who could I call over at the police station to get something sorted out? Uh, we also want to be able to deal with all the other issues that are coming up for our clients. Oftentimes they're coming in with a substance use disorder, but they also have, you know, housing insecurity or food insecurity. And we want to be able to point them to all those resources and have the relationships to make that happen. Because in a world where everybody is Googling everything, we know as behavioral health professionals, you've got to have somebody's cell phone number. You've got to be able to call them up, Johnny, what's going on? i got a client here. Um, you know, they have this, this, and this need. And because you have that relationship, 
as you take time to invest in that person, that relationship, you'll be able to, one, have smoother handoffs for your clients. It'll also be easier to make a referral because when you call the 1-800 number, it's a lot harder to get what you need done. And I think it's a reciprocal thing, right? If there's an outside agency and they know that you're there at the hospital uh, doing warm handoffs, somebody may call you, hey, we just had a thing with Johnny. We're going to bring him in. Make sure you're there. Come on in now. And so it really goes both ways. And, and I, just, I just didn't want to get out of this webinar without taking a chance to really kind of talk about how important relationships are in the social service world. Uh, so we've got a ton of questions that came in first. Thank you so much. Uh, Brandon and Mindy, we're going to really put you to work. We've got a ton of questions. The first question that came up for me, Brandon, when you were talking about the hospital shifts, you said that some people, some uh, programs are doing the kind of three shifts per day. You know, my wife is a nurse, and they work 12-hour shifts at her hospital. And you had mentioned that some of the recovery coaches are doing 12-hour shifts. What do you think is best? What's the feedback you're hearing? What's best for uh, their coaches? And also, what do you think is best for their consumers, the three, so, the eight-hour shifts or the 12-hour shifts? Well, I think that we want as much coverage as possible, right? Um, you made note earlier that the idea that people only overdose during banker's hours, so to speak, isn't going to be accurate. Like, um, I don't know. My personal experience, I, I, I wasn't, I guess I was up for overdose any time of day. But um, I think that the more coverage, the better is the, 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 the best practice in general. Um, one thing that I thought was unique um, that uh, Mel Reyes from Project Point, their program director over there, I was talking to her last week, and she had talked about, um, there's two Saturdays. Um, they, they don't always have weekend coverage, but they do have coverage on two specific Saturdays. Guess which ones those are? Well, the, the one after the first and the 15th of the month because people are collecting mm. checks during those times. And they were able to look back on their data from the first couple of years and realize that there were these huge spikes in visits. Um, and that's just from, 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 you know, we don't talk about data enough in our world. Um, we're way behind on it, but that's a good example of hospitals using that to figure out when they do need coverage, looking back on when the overdoses have been or when people present um, and reacting to that and making sure they're being as efficient as possible. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and just as a quick follow-up question, you know, how do we really prioritize, you know, we know that hospitals work on a 12-hour system. Like I said, my, my wife is a nurse, she works 12 hours, everybody at a hospital works 12-hour shifts. How do we protect the mental health of our peers when they're working in that kind of 12-hour long, long, maybe three 12-hour shifts a week and then four days off. How do we support them to make sure their wellness is a priority? And that was a follow-up question from Glory. Uh, Gloriana. Well, Sorry, Gloriana. Gloriana, I, think, I, that I think that one of the, the things on, on the slide around self, uh, you know, self-care and wellness, um, one of the things I refer to Project Point a lot in Eskenazi because they've been doing it the longest. They've worked out the most kinks. Um, and they pay their coaches to attend uh, recovery-based meetings, whatever their preference is. And, I mean, they have to write it on a board so all the doctors know that they're gone and they're out of the building. But uh, pretty much, as long as there's not something demanding at, at any time, they can go and make sure they're getting the care they need. We also have a monthly meeting um, in the community called Peers United. And that is a support group specifically for peers. Um, so they can go and they're not talking specifics or staffing, but they're getting support. Um, so peers that are new into these settings have the support that the first handful of peers did not have for the last couple of years when they were figuring this stuff out. All right, awesome. And then, Mindy, we had a question come in. I know that there's all these different terms, peer recovery specialist, recovery coach, uh, and all these other terms in between. What is really the difference, in your opinion, between peer, peer support specialist and recovery coach? Um, well, I, I would say uh, recovery coach is really geared towards people who are experiencing substance use issues. Uh, that's the big difference. Um, I, I cringe a little bit when we talk about intentional peer support as being only for mental health, though. That's something that I've gotten really hung up on. Uh, because the model itself is really about relationships, and I think that that can really work across the board. Um, 
what what I have found, at least my experience is what is really different is that intentional care support is a little less directive. So it's really about supporting people with with where they're at and where they want to go, like making their own goals and moving towards something instead of like this is really what you should be doing. We don't do that. Um, so that's definitely one of the significant differences that I've seen between the two. Um, and I don't think that. Uh, and, and Brandon, you can certainly speak to this if I'm, I'm misunderstood here, but I don't think that a recovery coach would go support somebody that was only experiencing mental health challenges, whereas intentional peer support, you know, does. All right, thanks for clearing that up. Um, go ahead, B. Well, I was just going to say you're right. I mean, it's, I think it's important. That there are distinctions, um, and, you know, the value in the peer is in their, their lived experience. Like, that's that's what makes them uniquely qualified um, to do stuff. So you're right. If somebody is presenting just with SMI, it's not going to be appropriate for, for, for a recovery coach, um, I don't believe, to engage. They don't have the training. The training doesn't consist of that mm -hmm. stuff. And, you know, recovery coaches are really, uh, the, there's, we've got that lived experience and can provide some hope, but being resource brokers, and being able to actually get people into places. Um, unfortunately, we live at a time, somebody, I, I didn't create this, I don't want to take credit for it, but they talked about the substance use treatment. You shouldn't have to know somebody to get help. And the way that our system is set up is if you don't know somebody, you're really in a tough spot, and the recovery coaches mm -hmm. help out with that. And it's sad that we have to do it, but you know, Billy, the recovery coach, he, he knows the people, the recovery resident. So he can place a phone call and say, hey, I know you guys got 15 on the waiting list, but I need you to make sure that, you know, this guy's going to call every day and he's going to be prepared to come in. And um, I don't want to say cash in favors, but, but having the connections, making calls, setting stuff up for people, our window is so small to help people. And if people um, don't feel good about where you're sending them, they don't feel like they, it's, uh, um, you know, this whole idea of warm handoff, that people are, and they, they're expecting the person to be coming. The person knows that they're expecting them. They feel comfortable in the situation. Um, it's just a really critical aspect of all this. Right. So, you know, I think a lot of us saw over the summer there was some outbreak of overdoses that were not related to opioids. Washington, D.C., Connecticut, New York, around those kind of synthetic cannabinoids. Um, Somebody comes to the ER experiencing a overdose that's not related to opioids. You know, do we are we seeing recovery coaches getting sent in? Should they be sent in? Mindy, what do you think? <laughs> uh, I can't speak to recovery coaches. I mean, we would certainly send our, our IPS folks in uh, no matter what it was that they overdosed on. Um, you know, and I think that's something that's unique about the work we do. We're not requiring them to follow a treatment plan. We're not requiring them necessarily to stay abstinent. You know, we're just planting seeds and maybe are, are you ready to do something differently? And when you are, we're going to be here, you know. Awesome. I'm brand that you mentioned it, Devin, because so we had, I think it was 21 or 27 overdoses specifically around Spice at one of our um, shelters down, down here. and. One of the things that, that it's getting cleared up now, but originally the, the funding, the federal money, um, was specifically around opioids. So the grants that were paying for the coaches and the EDs, uh, the person had to have Narcan administered to them in order to be engaged. And what we found out the hard way is you have people coming in and, and you know, withdraw from alcohol or benzodiazepines or cocaine or all these other substances, and they couldn't engage. And luckily, we, we had some good people in leadership that were able to clear those barriers, but um, these are the type of growing pains that we don't want other people to have to experience. So, you know, please take advantage of, of brass tacks and SAMHSA. If you need technical assistance, reach out to them. Um, get input from people that have, have done some of this stuff so these organizations don't have to, to make the same missteps um, when it comes to this type of stuff. All right. So, you know, obviously we're seeing this kind of, um, you know, a little bit of a division between our mental health peer specialists and our substance disorder peer specialists, but I really think it's important that we cross-train because a lot of times hospitals won't have both. Uh, so how do we prepare our SUD recovery coaches and our mental health peer specialists to work with the other side of the aisle, and what are some good resources that we could share with the audience today? Uh, ladies first, Mindy, go ahead. Um, so, I mean, here in Maine, the we have both available to people. 
Uh, all of the staff that I employ are trained in SIP, but we'll also be having them trained in the recovery coach model as well. So, and this is actually something kind of new for me. I'm a little biased. I really like the intentional peer support model. Um, so, but I've had several people tell me, you know, when they were early on in recovery, they really, they had no idea what they were doing and what worked for them was having somebody be like, this is what you need to do and really helping them lay out the steps for that. So. Um, I think just making sure uh, if you have staff that, that have those experiences, that those trainings are accessible for them. Um, there's a ton of different models on there. You know, they have the smart recovery model you can do online. Uh, and I know that the recovery coach uh, model is more and more accessible to people uh, across the country. So I think if you have somebody with both experiences, you know, supporting them to get trained, um, and, and being open to maybe doing things on an individual basis um, instead of just following the fidelity to either model. Right, right, right. So having a lot of tools in your tool belt is what I'm hearing you say. Absolutely, yes. Right, and Brandon? Well, I, I think that was a great response. I'd hate to, to, to muddy it up with anything I'm going to okay. add. I, I want to leave it there, actually. All right. So. You know, I think part of the reason that warm handoff became so popular an area of interest for policymakers and hospital administrators is, you know, the, the average person had a hard time understanding uh, the idea that somebody would be experiencing this, you know, kind of accidental poisoning with opioids presented at the hospital and then, you know, not be admitted, not engage in services. Um, what other services are available for people out there that don't, that, you know, they've just experienced this overdose, but they don't want to stop, they don't want to engage in treatment right now? What other services are available that maybe um, some of your people down in Indiana, Indiana could connect them with? So, um, you know, peer recovery coaches, uh, part of the, the CCAR training, it, it follows a harm reduction approach, and, and it's person-centered, and, and, and that's what it goes after. We're happy. Uh, actually, our governor, when he got in last year, he, he lowered the, the threshold for counties to be able to open uh, uh, low threshold service centers, syringe um, service centers is what we like to call them, um, and stay away from the stigmatizing language. Um, but this is a place where people can get, um, you know, things to make sure that they're staying healthy. Yes, syringes are one of them, but it also um, uh, alcohol swabs, uh, a variety of things. And they're also interacting with people a lot of times that are in recovery themselves. So um, I wish we had more of those options available in Indiana. I think we have eight counties right now that do have them. Um, and a lot of times this is actually, um, you know, I know the poll asked about the different areas where we can implement peers, and we talked about jails and treatment centers, um, EDs. Well, we've also found that syringe service programs and health departments are a great place to put peers into. Um, you know, Scott County, which uh, once it got so much attention because of, of the HIV epidemic that, that occurred, now is a beacon of hope for the recovery community. They've got 43 re trained recovery coaches in a town of like 25,000. They've got like 30% of the peer workforce, not that much, but about, about 18 or 20% of it in that one small county, and a lot of them are coming through the health department uh, providing those, those services. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I think that you know, those low threshold prog programs are, are really important because we do know that people that engage with syringe service programs are actually four ti five times more likely to enter treatment than their peers that are not engaged. Wow, we got a lot of questions coming in. Uh, one that I thought was really interesting that I haven't uh, really seen a best answer to is, you know, sometimes we're lucky enough to be able to take somebody right from the ER to uh, a, an actual um, intake at a residential treatment bed what do we think is best? Do we want to be transporting those clients? Do we want to see them transporting themselves? Uh, you know, uh, Brandon, how about for you? What do you think is best? What do you think that's working? So it definitely varies, and obviously if somebody wants treatment, we want to get them in. Um, most of the EDs that I'm aware of, they are not allowing peers to transport people. Um, that being said, just because they're not, they are setting up uh, agreements with uh, transportation and services. It's easy 
um, in the metro area. There's a whole bunch of transportation. It gets harder in rural, but they're almost, I think they're doing a, a recovery share ride in several counties to where there are people, uh, a lot of them peers, willing to, almost, almost like recovery um, Uber or, or, or something along those lines um, for those rural and hard to reach areas where transportation is an issue. but. Um, getting them there um, is the important part, them showing up, not who much, so much who takes them. No, I, I think that's awesome. Recovery Uber. Somebody, somebody uh, trademarked that. So we know a lot of times that, you know, our peers also are advocates, and a lot of times when they go into the hospital settings or uh, law enforcement settings or other non-traditional settings with peers, they actually need to be advocates and educate the doctors and the nurses I believe we saw Tony talking a little bit earlier in the chat box about how she was able to educate a nurse that she worked with about her role and how she, when she connected with a peer, the nurse was like, oh, my God, can you be here all the time? You know, what kind of feedback are you hearing from, you know, your staff about their process educating, you know, the more educated or higher credential uh, team members about what it is they do and why lived experience matters? Mindy? Uh, we've, we've designed pamphlets and handouts uh, to oh, keep at the places nice. which the peers are going into. So a piece of my work is uh, overseeing this network for the last uh, five or six years uh, with developing a toolkit. And I mean, there's a lot of really great resources out there, but obviously it has to be specific to the state that you're working in and the model that you're utilizing. Um, so I found that it was really helpful in the ED to let the nurses know, you know, and have something available for them because there's a lot of turnover in those places uh, that they could pick up and read about and know that our, our staff were actually trained. Uh, they weren't just these people with lived experience, you know, coming into their emergency department. They've undergone extensive training and they have to, you know, keep up on that. Um, and that's been really, really helpful as far as educating them. But we're also fortunate to have the consumer, the peer support network here in Maine and uh, myself and some other people are available to go around to agencies and do trainings for people who are, are interested in what it is we're doing. And that's been really helpful. All right, awesome. And you think you, we can get those resources, the pamphlets to share with the people that are on this? Sure. Sweet. Uh, Brandon, do you have any thoughts on that, um, how um, our staff or our peers can educate the people that they work with on their uh, teams, regardless of the setting? We are, look, we are the advocates out there in the community. And what I was really shocked to find out is I don't know how it is in every um, state, but the amount of continuing education for doctors is minimal. It is really, really low. If you have hospital admitting pr privileges, then hospitals set what you have to have, which is, which is a, they have a pretty good standard, but a lot of primary care physicians don't have to have any continuing education, so it's all at their discretion. So think of what's changed over the last 10 years when it comes to substance use disorders. Think about, um, how the evidence-based practices have come around. And we have to um, be that voice for the recovery community that we're, when we're out there. And um, physicians, primary care, nurses, um, jails, sheriffs, uh, a lot of people want the help. They just don't have the proper information. You know, we got to, you know, I don't like medication. It's trading a, a drug for a drug. They need to be told that, no, you're trading a drug for a medication a medication that's proven to save people's lives, that reduces mortality by, by, by 50%. We have to be advocates for peer supports, treating this as a chronic condition. Um, this, I, I think that's our role in the community. Right. Uh, you know, I couldn't agree more. And just to piggyback that uh, and respond to what Katie Beckler had said, you know, um, it's hard to hate up close, and a lot of people have things they make up in their mind about people that use drugs or have mental health concerns. And when they're on a team working with somebody every day that's in recovery from a substance use disorder or a mental health concern, they can see that uh, a lot of their judgments that they had or preconceived notions are wrong because people do recover from all kinds of problems. And then quite often we thrive in that recovery and we go on and dedicate our lives to helping other people. But you know, that's another great reason why we need peers is to to educate our doctors. Uh, so this is a, a tough question that I, I have no idea the answer to, so I'm going to toss this out to either one of you. You know, with recovery coaches being contracted by a third party and not officially um, hospital staff, you know, how do we tell, if you were talking to a new recovery coach or 
uh, peer specialists that's thinking about getting this work. How do they protect themselves from a liability point of view? Do they need insurance? Is their work supposed to cover that? You know, as a social worker, you know, if I was licensed, I would have practicing insurance. What about peers? What do they do? I find the idea of liability just comes from a very, a very care-based place. Uh, obviously, Amistad has insurance that covers us. Uh, I can tell you in the 16 years we've been overseeing this program, we have never had any litigation against us for anything. So I think just uh, making sure that the people you're hiring are competent and trained, that's the biggest thing. Right. Right. How about you, Brandon? How would, how would you answer that if somebody asked? Well, I think that you need to make sure that, uh, you, as an organization, you, you want to make sure that you're covered and that you're not open to, to a whole bunch of liability. But there's a lot of different positions where you have volunteers or you have people in the community. Like, let's not forget these are not clinical positions. You know, so, so while there may be a, a little bit of a parallel, um, that it's not a clinical position giving therapeutic advice. This is a, a peer position. Um, and I think that really, um, you know, I'm certainly not an attorney. I don't want to, to appear as one. but. Um, I, I think it lends itself to what Mindy said. I think that it's really kind of fear-based, and we haven't had, had a whole bunch of issues. Right, right, right. So, you know, I know, you know, working in Philadelphia that our challenges with warm handoff are a lot different than maybe in rural Indiana. Any tips? We've got people from all over from, you know, Baltimore to Alaska. What tips do we have for our rural partners uh, that, you know, a couple of things you've got to keep in mind for rural warm handoff programs? I, for me, I think it's about um, aligning resources. You know, recovery community organizations are, are really something that's coming on. I, I hope that everybody that's on here has one in their community. And if not, I hope they're talking about having it. But the reason I'm talking about this is because part of that creating one is getting all your stakeholders at the table and all the different people that provide resources. And, and so you know exactly what your community has and exactly what they don't have. So you can, one, advocate for to fill those gaps, but the, you, you don't have peers making recommendations that aren't going to be met um, within the local community, um, and also seeing if there is some, some resources that you can leverage from surrounding counties, possibly. Uh, it's one thing to set up the virtual peers um, and do a, a telepeer uh, like they're doing for a lot of different rural services, but that doesn't create all the other uh, recovery supports. It doesn't create recovery housing. It doesn't um, we create, create the RCOs, it doesn't create uh, view providers. Um, so knowing exactly what we have, what we don't have, and trying to leverage um, other resources in the region. Not every, like We have 92 counties in Indiana, and we don't need an RCO in all 92 of them. Some of them are really small. It, it may be that one RCO actually helps serve five or six counties. So making sure that you're working with, with, with the people, the communities around you as well to fill gaps, not just your own. Right, and how about you, Mindy? What do you think? How, what are our tips for our rural partners and watchers? Um, you know, I, I think, as Brandon touched on a lot of it, <clears throat> telecommunication, I find myself doing a lot of live streaming for trainings and, and Adobe, nice. um, you know, a lot of phone support as well. So in Maine, we're pretty lucky that we have the intentional warm line, which is a 1-800 number. You can get 24-7 intentional peer support, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so if that's something that your state doesn't have, I would always suggest that. And I'm just, I'm not as familiar with other states, but I know something that's working for us here uh, is now that we've shif shifted to this like Section 92 billing system, um, they're required to have a peer support specialist on staff at all of the behavioral health home agencies, which is not a home, but like more holistic mental health services. So that's really, really helped in our rural settings. Um, I'm also in the process, we are developing a statewide resource guide, which will probably take me the next two years, uh, you know, but I think that when that is finalized, uh, it's going to be really helpful, especially for the people in rural communities. All right, awesome. So we got a couple of minutes. We got a couple of minutes before we wrap up. Uh, I just want to give you both an opportunity to, you know, throw anything in that you felt like, oh, I want to talk about this one thing, but I forgot, and then I'll roll into the ending credits. I don't really right, have maybe. anything. I'm just, I'm really impressed okay. with all of the questions and just want to thank everybody for being so interactive. 
Awesome. Brandon? I can, I, I can agree with that part more. I was or, you know, trying to respond to as much as possible in the chat box and just uh, there's been some fabulous questions. I can, uh, I can feel the passion um, through, the, through the chat box with the questions and um, look, uh, we've treated substance use disorder in the criminal justice system for so long. And we know it's a disease now, we know it's a healthcare issue, but it's going to take a really long time to turn the ship um, and really treat it like a chronic issue. And peers, to me, are the link in between it being treated as an acute care issue and a chronic issue um, to provide the ongoing support um, for, for years, just like we would any other chronic condition. And we've got to get people um, during, to, while they're in those main entry points, while they're um, in jail, while they're in emergency departments. And um, I just, I couldn't be happier for this movement. I couldn't be happier for the recovery community. Um, I think this is a big part of the solution and just grateful to um, be involved in it at, at all. All right, awesome, thanks, Steve. Uh, I just wanna thank, uh, oh, first, here's a bunch of resources that everybody can check out. Uh, feel free to click on those links and remember that there are a bunch of links here in the toolbox section and we will be sending everyone the transcripts and a link this webinar has been recorded to be able to watch it, share it with your friends, put it out there. Um, if you have any specific questions or want to learn some more information, you can put in a TA request that is also available. If you want to find out more about Brass Tax, feel free to email them or reach out for technical assistance. Also, I would sign up for the Brass Tax um, listserv. There's always great information going on there. Uh, I can tell you that I'm really passionate about warm handoff. I was super excited to be part of this. I know that a lot of times when somebody's experiencing an overdose, that, that uh, may be just another Tuesday for us, but for them, that's the worst day of their lives. And to be able to help be the launch pad to their recovery journey is just really, really exciting for me. Uh, after this webinar is done, when you click off, there'll be a quick survey. It only takes a couple of minutes. We want to know how we can improve, how we can be better. So please take some time to do that. And again, thanks for taking some time out of your afternoon and coming to participate with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you all. Bye, everybody.